sound lovely. <laughs> and we have ushered in this Easter morning, and we have prepared ourselves to receive a beautiful message. We have opened our hearts and our minds, and now we're ready to receive the encouragement from Reverend John Scott, our pastor. And we didn't coordinate our outfits. <laughs> I want you to know. So good morning, family. And if you're visiting for the first time, you're still family. Welcome to our hearts. It's a joy to just see you beaming on an Easter morning, radiant as the rising sun. And if you're visiting with us on the World Wide Web, I also greet you in the spirit and the consciousness of that which rises infinite and supreme and beautiful in every human heart every day, not just on Easter Sunday. This is the truth which we believe and we affirm that God is at the center and circumference of everybody's life. Now, friends of mine know that I'm always looking for anecdotes and jokes on what, what have you to, to get your attention when I give an encouragement. And so this one um, I got from a friend and I, I prayed hard about whether I should share it and I said, well, I'm a high risk taker. <laughs> it's the story of the Sunday school teacher on Easter morning who wanted, at a country church, you know, wanted to impress the, vis the visiting archbishop with how wonderful the Sunday school children had been prepared, you know. So she said, tell his grace, children, what you know about resurrection. Silence. Uh, come on, yeah, come on. Uh, his grace wouldn't know what you know if you don't tell him. Silence. Little Johnny, tell, tell the archbishop what you know about resurrection and our little five-year-old hero lists. Well, I saw it on television. So the teacher said, really? Tell us what you heard about resurrection on television. And he said, if you, don't, if you have one last thing longer than four hours, you should see your doctor. <laughs> You have to be careful what you ask children to do in public. <laughs> Always lasts through eternity. So my encouragement today is titled, Easter, Your Story of Overcoming and Renewal. Now there are many theories about this Easter story and the myth and about Jesus and that great demonstration he made. So some have said that he studied in the Far East and he knew with the great masters and therefore he knew how to uh, slow down his metabolism so that he appeared to be dead and then revive himself a few days later. Others believe that his, his corporeal, his body, his physical body was so refined by his years of meditation and prayer and communion with God that it, he actually was able to transcend and transfigure and the light within him shone so brightly that, that um, even his disciples couldn't look at him, you know, it, he, he shone so radiantly. So this resurrection story has really puzzled philosophers and, and theologians and what have you for eons. And you know, I think it's really interesting because a lot of times we worry about the details and the minutiae of what great thinkers and great, great leaders um, do and lose the message. You know, so you know, I don't care if he was born on the 25th of December or April, or I think he was born in October on my birthday, the 20th, you know. And it doesn't matter to me whether he, he actually died or he was appeared to die and then, you know, was in a deep state of meditation, which, which the masters in the Far East um, demonstrate all the time. That's not what's important. What is important is the message. And what was his message? His message was love one another. Not only love those that are of your tribe. He was a good Jew, and he didn't was saying, don't only love Jews. You know Jesus was a Jew, practicing. 
So, the fundamentalists don't like to be told that I saw one of them who I know from school days at Megamart a few days ago, and he said, what have you given up for Lent, Reverend? I said, the church. <laughs> that was the end of that discussion as I <laughs> bought my Easter eggs and <laughs> chocolate eggs, you know. And, uh, so, <laughs> I can't tell you that we need to get back to the meaning what is it all about, really? What are we celebrating this morning? What is the whole world celebrating? Manly P. Hall writes in his book, The Mystical Christ, and I quote, we accept the miracles of nature, but find it hard to estimate the miracles of religion. Actually, generation is as difficult to explain as regeneration. We accept the outward growth of creatures as they unfold the potentials locked in the seed, the egg, and the womb. Why then does it appear remarkable that faculties and propensities of the human compound should also enlarge and come into the fullness of their own potentials? If plants grow toward the light of the sun, why should not souls grow toward the light of God, which is the source of their nutrition? End of that quote. So the beautiful Jesus demonstrated that life need not be an experience of dying. The Easter story then is a call to each of us to take the giant step from here to eternity and we do not need to die to do it. As students of the science of mind, you know friends, we reject that idea that from the moment you're born you're dying. You know, because we believe that life is eternal in different forms and when you take off this costume, as lovely as it is, there are others more fine and more beautiful for you to express your, who you are in the realm of the infinite. Father Bruce Sanguin, the evolutionary Christian thinker, tells how biologist Elizabeth Saturis offers a great analogy that helped him to, un to interpret the Easter story. And I like it because when I hear Maestro and Valerie playing, it takes me right there. Uh, um, Saturis relates that physicists talk about the sound vibrations at various frequencies as constitutive of the universe. So she's saying that she has this image, which I love, of a cosmic keyboard, you know, similar to the one that, that Valerie plays, but bigger. Science deals with the low and mid-range frequencies, she says. That is the science dealing with matter and electromagnetic energy. Religion, on the other hand, plays on the higher part of the keyboard in the realm of spirit. Isn't that a nice, a nice image? On the low side of the, the grosser side of our physical being and our, our physical demonstration in the world and the high soprano notes on the higher side of the scale is, are the finer vibrations of spirit. And so for decades science and religion got stuck playing one part of the keyboard and making the claim that the only mu the music that made any sense came from their part of the, of the keyboard. So the scientists were saying, it's down here, to doom to doom to doom And the spiritualists were saying, it's up here, to doom to doom to doom Well, the Easter story is not the story of a supernatural God who intervened in Jerusalem 2,000 odd years ago, suspending the laws of nature with a supernatural miracle. Rather, it is a story that encapsulates and catalyzes the story of a resurrection impulse that is active at all levels. And that if you really want to become a master, as Jesus was, you have to learn to play on both ends of the keyboard and to combine those melodies to make the music of your own life. You like that, you like that analogy? So when you listen to Maestro and Valerie playing today, just remember that it's, it's really your music because you actually are on that continuum from the gross physical uh, experience that you're having to the very finest love vibrations which, which put you in tune with the, all of the cosmos on this cosmic keyboard of pure beauty and pure love. So in the story about the first Easter morning, we are told that the woman, it's always the woman, isn't it? 
the woman went early in the morning. Women can't stand the sight of blood, and we don't like hospital, let alone morgue. And it's the women that have to do all of that, you know? And then we turn around and say they're the weaker sex. Nonsense. <laughs> on a strong, on a strong, on a strong, can't done. And so they went in the early hours of Easter morning with their heads bowed. I can just see them with their veils drawn halfway over their tear-stained faces to find the body of their beloved and to attend to it. And here's what the story says. They're wandering among themselves, how are we going to move this big stone that blocks the seal of the sepulcher? And the story tells us that looking up just listen to it carefully. Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. And my friends, right there in that one sentence is the answer to every problem you have, believe it or not. Listen to it. Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. You ever see people who are depressed how they walk? How are you? Okay. Can I do anything to help? No, I'm fine. People who are joyous say, hello. They look up. So friends, if you keep looking down at the problem, if you keep looking down at the diagnosis, if you keep looking down at your cash flow, if you keep looking down at your broken relationship, or whatever else, the last job, whatever else is bothering you, you will never see the potential that is right there waiting for you to look up and see the truth of your own spiritual magnificence, your own beauty, and your own capability to overcome. Because you come equipped with everything you need to overcome any vicissitudes that you can imagine possible. And the woman looked up. And once they looked up, there was a whole different story. And it began something so awesome that it has lasted through the centuries. And people have embellished it. And people have taken it literally or have made, made all kinds of interpretations of it. But the truth is the demonstration was you can rise above anything that you are facing this morning. Wow. And if it lasts more than four hours. <laughs> you see, you get fixated on the problem. And you know, we think, when I prayed about this, you know, I said, am I going to share this naughty joke with them? And because it's not so ministerial and it's not so Easter Sunday-ish. And I thought, but I write my own script. And if I give it with love, it will be taken with love. So thank you for loving me. <laughs> you know, friends, when we awaken to the truth, we can say with confidence, I am one with the infinite, and I can do what needs to be done. Can we say that? I am one with the infinite, and I can do what needs to be done. And then say with me, through the Christ power that indwells me, I can succeed. Through the Christ power that indwells me, I can succeed. I can be what I want to be. I can be what I want to be. Today I look up and rise victorious. Today I look up and rise victorious. Emma Curtis Hopkins, one of the founders of the New Thought Movement, who became known as the teacher of teachers, in her book, Scientific Christian Mental Practice, writes, and I quote, and just listen to this. In the midst of what seems your degradation, when you look old, feel sick, fear poverty, cry at failure, if you would cease to give way to these things just for one instant, you will see the meaning of it all, that it is for you to know that you are a transcendent being with transcendent powers. You are a transcendent being with transcendent powers. Let us say that together. I am a transcendent being with transcendent powers. I am a transcendent being with transcendent powers. Say it in a half voice. I am a transcendent being 
with transcendent powers. Say it in a whisper. I am a transcendent being with transcendent powers. And now close your eyes and say it in your heart. Ah. You feel the shift in energy? As you go from the high, I am, to the quiet. Yes, it's true. I really am. I really am. Dr. Kathy Hearn, who is Dean of the Center for Spiritual Living School of Spiritual Leadership at our San Diego campus, in an article titled, The Science of the Christ. You see, friends, I've said it to you before. I named John Scott. Jesus is called Jesus Christ. Christ wasn't his last name. Christ is the principle of your sonship and daughtership with Almighty God. So when we talk about through the power of the Christ in me, what we are saying is that through the power of my daughtership or my sonship with the Almighty, I can do whatever I need to do to conquer and to overcome and to transcend. And that's why Jesus said, I have overcome the world. Wow. We can overcome the world. So the center of your being. Let me tell you what Kathy Heron says, and I quote, Easter is the story of the power of spirit that lives within life, within our individual lives, in the very cells, fibers, tissues of our bodies, and in our very being. And that power that moves with all things and lifts them over and over again above the challenges, sorrows, and limitations of the world. It is the story of overcoming and renewal. It is an annual reminder that in the darkest moments, the deepest trials, and even in the less dramatic times of struggle against fear, doubt, depression, and financial uncertainty, there is a light. The truth of spirit's presence at the center of our being that burns with power. There is a light at the center of our beings that burns with power. And every Sunday when those children light the, the youth candle, I want you to think about that, that there's a light within them. You see, sometimes when you're, a, when you're a parent and you despair and say, Lord have mercy, take the case, Jesus, guide me and pilot me with a picnic. Yeah. Just remember, there's a light within them. That the creative, yes, the creative intelligence within them is directing them. So look up. Stop looking down at the mess they've made of the bedroom. Look up at the potential in those, in those spirits of beauty and truth and love and joy. And you know what? They, they shame you. you know, you're the teenagers and you think, those, if I'm telling you this room belongs to MPM, it needs to come and clean it out. And they go to visit somebody abroad and stay with relatives and you get a report. How perfectly mannered they are and helpful in the kitchen. You say, who, my picking any? No. They astound you and astonish you. Because once it's in them, you can't take it away. So I see all the time children who have been in Sunday school here, and then they, they grow up, and they move away, and they don't come to church anymore, or they follow some boy to another place, or some girl. And you can just see it in them. They're living the truth that they learned here. So guess what I've, I've, I decided when I gave up church for Lent? I don't need the credit. I want the people who come here to be touched, to open their hearts, to learn, to be transformed, and to take that light into the world that others may see and seek to find the light on the altar of their own hearts in their own lives. Can I have an amen? Amen. Uh -huh. Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of our great teaching, writes in his book, Gateway to Tomorrow, and I quote, everything Jesus did was done as an object lesson to teach us the relationship we have to the world, to each other, to the next world, and to God. He taught that there is no long period between sleeping to this world and waking to the next. For he said to the thief on the cross beside him, Verily I say unto thee, Today, today, not tomorrow, not some future time, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. 
It seems as though the whole life and teaching of Jesus was to give people the hope and the assurance that they are one with God and therefore their personal lives continue to exist beyond the grave. End of that quote. So on another level, the Easter story is a demonstration that you have the power to overcome what is known in the Bible and in, in, in certain cosmology as the dark night of the soul. You know, when you're going through what is really a dark, dark period in your life and you don't see any way out, Jesus came to teach the overcoming of that, that you can walk through the valley of the shadow and you needn't stop to build a condominium and spend eternity. You can move on in triumph because you are the beloved of the Father in whom he's well pleased. In his book, Spiritual Liberation, Dr. Michael Beckwith of the Agape Center in Los Angeles recommends a valuable spiritual practice for when the dark night you may be experiencing seems to embrace eternity and just to stre stretch beyond you with no, with no seeming ending. And I've chosen his little exercise as your assignment for this week. Regulars at the Temple of Light know that I always give an assignment. And I know those who do it and those who hang their head down because they don't always do it. Look up. <laughs> Look up and see the stone. That is, your ego has been rolled away from the tomb of your own doubt and your own, Lord, I should go to the gym today. You know that stone? I tell people when I feel exercise coming on, I sit down till the feeling passes. It, it takes about five minutes, you know. And then I learned in your linguistic programming that if you do it in your mind with enough detail, your body thinks you're doing it. Oh my God. <laughs> Lying flat on my back <laughs> with a glass of wine beside me. <laughs> Exercising like crazy. It's not even bold can beat me. <laughs> so here's your assignment. Should you decide to undertake it? Ask yourself if you are going through a low period. In fact, ask yourself whether you're going through a low period or not. Where and how can I give of myself? Where can I begin to express and radiate? Where and how can I give of myself? When people who are depressed come to me, the first thing I say to them is you need to do some act of service. To get out of yourself and focusing on your story and your pity party and your poor me and do something for someone else. There's a little lady next door who has arthritis. See if you can help her tidy up the house or bring some groceries for her and stop focusing about your smaller problem. So letting go of the judging mind that labels your experience as one of lack, pain, limitation, frustration, failure, confusion, or aridity is accomplished through selfless service. Ask yourself, how and where can I serve? And I have some suggestions, right? Yeah. We need you. So in the coming weeks, you're going to be hearing how you can become more involved in our Ministry of Truth right here in Jamaica. You are going to be invited to a town hall meeting to refocus on our vision, and that vision is awakening humanity to its spiritual magnificence, creating a world that works for everyone. And I want you to know that we see every person who engages with our spiritual community as playing an important role in the spread of this transformative teaching known as the science of mind. And like I said, we don't need the credit, we just want you to live it out there so that you touch people with the truth that you know. Live from that mountain top of your soul that says, I am triumphant, I am one with the resurrection and the renewal and the overcoming that is the truth about my Christ nature and my Christ potential. So you see, friends, when in the midst of your Gethsemane experience you ask, where may I give of myself in service to others, you expand a bit beyond what Beckwith terms the little egoic self. That's a little you. You look up and find that the stone is rolled away from the tomb of doubt and fear so that you rise triumphant into the freedom that is to be found in your larger self, your God self. 
Perhaps this is the, what Jesus meant when he said, you should be born again in John 3, verse 3. The kingdom about which he, the master is talking is within us and all around and about us. When we are born again, nothing really happens to us in a three-dimensional, five-sensory sense. Everything is essentially the same. But you are vibrating at a higher frequency. The frequency at the top end of the cosmic keyboard that has the most delicate notes. Wow. And it gets supported by your corporeal and grosser self, because you have to cook food when you go home today. Well, not today. Today you're having brunch with us, so you won't have to cook today. But normally you have to go home and cook, and that's your getting the business of life done down by the bass notes, while your soul is singing in harmony with that. A melody so sweet and so fine and so beautiful that even the angels join in, all of, all of life. You know, it was wonderful. A few weeks ago, a little hummingbird uh, built her nest up there. She had us distracted the entire time. And when the fan was off, she would fly straight. Beeline from out there in the neem tree, whoop. When the fan was on, she went up to Mr. Dexter's platform and across. Isn't that amazing, that intelligence that can do that? And then one day I came um, to work, and the little lady who cleans for us, Beverly, was in a, quite a distress because one of the fledglings had either been pushed or had fallen out of the nest. And it couldn't quite fly. It would just make a little quick up. So it was all over the sanctuary. And I said to them, don't touch her. Because if you touch her, the mother bird won't have anything to do with her. That mother bird found her wherever she was in the sanctuary. At one time, she was out in the vestibule um, doing what you will be doing, signing the visitor's book, I think. <laughs> and then she found herself over here by the grand piano. And the mother came in with clockwork regularity and fed her. And our lady who cleaned said, we never said that yet. It's like, it's like we mothers. No matter which part they pick in them, turn, we find them and we look after them. Again, it's the mothers. And then to our distress one afternoon, it fell into the, the little pond that's behind those, those plants. And so we, her little beak was up and she was just keeping her head above water. And um, Sean got the fish net from the, the garden, from the fish pond, and fished her out. And we put her in the sun right over there until she was dried out. And then we put her in a plant saucer on some grass and put her right there. And the mother came as soon as we put her down and fed her. Then we moved her back up onto the speaker box so that she'd be nearer the nest. And the mother came and fed her. And that mother tended to her for the entire time until she was, until she was able to fly on her own up into the neem tree. Wow. You talk about miracles? And isn't that a miracle? So I don't understand it. I don't understand what makes a, a, this, a, 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 a tiny winged leaf, turn into this. But that is a miracle. And we don't need to know exactly how. What we do need to know is that with that creative intelligence that is in each of us, it happens. We don't, we don't have to, to worry. The caterpillar that we are will turn into a butterfly. It is our guarantee of renewal and of rising above. All we need to do is to look up. You know, one of my favorite Easter hymns um, is Christ the Lord is risen today. Are we going to have it today, uh, Maestro? Are we having it? Give, give me a line of it. <laughs> Songs of men and angels sing, hallelujah. High above the dome we fly, hallelujah. Somebody knows the words, not I. That is the truth, and so must we. 
And if we could only understand that that demonstration is the story of our lives, and that when we triumph and rise up, when we look up and we triumph, all of nature sings the Easter anthem of our own lives. Wow. So Beckwith says, you have got to stand when you are feeling hopeless and vision has been tossed upon a stormy sea. Joy is there in your soul. Get on up and stand and say, God is enough for me. Let us get to our feet and say that. God is enough for me. God is enough for me. I'm not convinced. God is enough for me. Christ is risen in me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Valerie and Master, can you just play the, the, um, the, the chant that we had earlier? I praise my life, I raise my life in the name of... No. I praise my life, I raise my life in the name of love. Hold somebody's hand. I praise my neighbor. I praise my neighbor. I raise my neighbor in the name of love. Amen. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs>